Welcome to our webinar. Today's a really cool um, event that I think we've got, and it really is a look back of a story that's really personal to the two speakers on here. What did we learn as we went through a non-traditional merger in that? And so we're very excited to share that with people. So as we get into it, I'm going to facilitate today's session. My name is Tom Waddleton. I'm a virtual CFO with Summit CPA Group. So I have about 20 clients. I act as their business consultant in the capacity of CFO, sometimes in controller. So I really look forward to it. Um, I'll also give some of my thoughts as an employee from I was a summit before the merger and how I felt like things went with that to add to what Dave and Jody are talking about. So before we jump into the content, just a little bit of housekeeping. So today's a one credit hour session. We'll go 50 minutes and there will be three polling questions. I probably will not announce those. So please watch for those. You do have to answer all three of those. We will email CPE certificates, um, so within the next week or so to people who meet that criteria, um, and also we'll send out slides. Um, one of the most common questions, can we get copies of slides? Um, I will tell you, coming toward the very end, a lot of the content from here, we wrote a book. You'll see a QR code at the end of this that people can get access to. So I think we've got some great information. We've even got more information in that book. And like I said, I'll land on that at the very end so that you can get access to that. And then you'll see the, the question function. We monitor this really closely, so people can't speak to us during the webinar, but you can ask those questions. So each of the speakers are going to be watching these. I'll really watch those closely and as much as we can either answer those back through the question function or more likely on a live, um, live kind of question. Okay, so our two speakers today. Um, so Jody Grunden, co-founder of Summit CPA Group. Um, Jody did the virtual CFO role and then led the firm. Um, and then Dave Hartley worked with Anders before the merger. Dave is a partner of the advisory services group of which we are now a part of and a division of that. So to the two of you, welcome. We're excited to hear what you've got to tell us today. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So, so Jody, in the story we're going to begin with, tell us a little bit about Summit before the merger. And then we'll ask Dave, tell us a little bit about Anders. So people just have an idea what those two firms kind of were before. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, with, with Summit, well, a lot of people ask me, you know, Hey, would, you know, I'm not interested in merging with another firm mm -hmm. or, I, you know, what, why, why would I attend this or, or, or what, what, what can I glean from this? And, and I'll tell you from right now, when, when uh, Anders approached us in, in October of what, 2021, I had zero intention at that point of merging with it, with another firm, getting bought out, anything like that. Um, you know, things are going well. Why, why would we? Our profit margins were high. We we're hitting, you know, 20% plus profit margins. Our revenue is growing and doubling in size every three years. We we're approaching about, uh, you know, 10, 11, $12 million in revenue. And we had long-term goals of hitting 20 over the next, you know, five years. And, and the growth pattern was so great and, is, and it has been continued growth pattern why would we ever do that? I guess is a, is a, is a question mark. And, and I can, I can stand here and tell you it was a great decision. You know, I'm, I'm glad we did do it. You know, so I, I guess for those that, that aren't in the position of merging, you know, keep your eyes, keep your eyes and ears open. It, 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 ne it never hurts to talk to, to folks out there, you know, 90% of them you're going to say no, and it's not going to be a good fit. And that's cool. But from each one of them, you'll learn uh, from what uh, you want, and what you don't want. And I think that's the important thing uh, going through, uh, this with everyone here, I wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about what what made us kind of different, and uh, you know than than what a traditional accounting firm merger, you know, would look like. And, and the the first thing, and if you know a lot about Summit, then you probably already know a lot of this, is that that we focus primarily on two different service levels, service lines. The, one of them was remote uh, benefit plan audits, so four one k audits, uh, that comprised about five to ten percent of our business, and so we did roughly 150 to 200 uh, benefit plan audits, and we did those 100% remotely. And so that was one of the different service lines. Uh, the, the other service line, which comprised about 85% of what we did was the virtual CFO service. And so, and what do we mean by that? It was high-end um, st strategy. So meeting with clients, going through the high-end stuff. So you'd probably call it CAS 2.0 for those that want to identify within the, um, the, the AICPA terminology. Uh, so we were providing CAS 2.0 for, you know, about 150 clients generating, you know, in roughly about $10 million in fees for us. Uh, so the, again, high, high end level, we did about a third of our clients that we worked on. We did provide CAS 1.0 stuff. So that would be like bill paying, cash flow management, you know, that sort of thing. And so it was kind of a combination of, of, the, of those two that um, was, was basically where we had our high growth at. 
um, but both were growing at a very high rate and very high profitability. What made us a little different and challenging for a lot of firms uh, out there was that we we had you know four different areas that uh, were uncommon in the accounting profession. One was inbound marketing. Now, now I know a lot of firms out there try inbound marketing and doing inbound marketing, but that was primarily how we received our new clients. And so for a lot of firms are are partner centric, where new clients come in from the partner uh, aspect, you know, going out meeting people, you know, country club, all that kind of stuff. We we didn't we didn't take that approach, and so we went content marketing approach. And so when people were coming to Summit. They were coming to Summit because they saw content on the internet. They saw uh, one of us speak at an event. They maybe read a book. You know, so there's a lot of different things that drew people into that, and, and that was a that was a num- that was number one reason for our high growth was the fact that we content marketed. We had tons of inbound marketing where we pick up on average today between four to six clients a month at an average bill rate of about ninety thousand dollars. A client between eighty to ninety thousand dollars, and so that was a, a significant difference from a lot of accounting firms out there. The other thing was subscription-based billing, where we don't bill by the hour at all, and so a lot of accounting firms bill by the hour, and we went away from that twenty years ago. And so we've been doing subscription-based billing, where we actually don't have an AR. We zap their bank account every Monday, and uh, uh, it's kind of a nice. Like, like I said, Mondays are my favorite day of the month, our favorite day of the week, because. <laughs> That's when we get all of our money. So we get it every single Monday and we don't bill, we don't bill out monthly. We don't send invoices out. It's, it's truly a subscription-based billing model. And our service levels you know, reflect that. Uh, the other thing would be a, a, we have a um, fully remote workforce. So we've had roughly 50-ish people on the team, fully, you know, full-time employees, and another 15 folks uh, that are contractors abroad where they uh, may be outside of the country, from India to the Philippines, Canada, Mexico, and so forth. Um, but with our team, we didn't have a home base. And so we had no place to go to uh, for team meetings, nothing like that, because, again, our team is completely spread throughout the United States. Uh, so that made it uh, an interesting concept as well. And then our fourth one was our variable pay con- our par- variable pay structure, where our team wasn't promoted in, in their pay increases based on how long they've been with the company. It was based on the book of business that they were managing. And so as, as I mentioned before, our entire you know, focus was inbound marketing to create that book of business. And what we would do is we'd feed our team so that uh, they'd receive a, a national average salary base pay. But if they wanted to work more and, and really kind of manage that book of business and really kind of work within that, uh, they could receive a variable comp in addition to that, which made it super nice for a lot of our, our team members because then they can control, they, they had complete autonomy and can control the amount of money they wanted to make the amount of time they wanted to put into the company and, and work. And so it gave that really nice work-life balance. And so those were like the four big areas that we had to kind of, when we're looking at somebody to, to purchase us, they had to be acceptance of those uh, of those four areas and something that uh, we, 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 you know, it, it was kind of tricky in finding a, a perfect match for that. Great. Good description. Dave, can you tell us a little bit about Anders and kind of, especially before the merger? Sure. Absolutely. So, um, Anders has always been a very entrepreneurial firm. So the firm has over a 60 year history and uh, the, 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 the focus on innovating, adding new services, improving the client experience, that's been a focus of the firm for a long time. So the firm structured in three major groups, uh, the, the advisory group, which is the piece of the firm that I lead, uh, we'll talk more about that later. And then the audit and assurance practice. So full, you know, full service, everything, you know, financial statement audits, 401k audits, SOC engagements, you know, all those types of things are covered under that. And then the tax practice, we've we've actually got one of the largest tax practices in the Midwest uh, with a lot of focus on fairly high end, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, complex tax situations. So a lot of advisory work as part of the tax practice uh, is, is handled uh, throughout the firm. So um, I won't go into as much detail as Jody did, but just to give you some, some highlights, the uh, book prior to the pandemic, we had been experimenting with fully re- remote work arrangements and mm-hmm. trying to, you know, crack the code on that. And then the pandemic happened and that, you know, accelerated everything for everybody. But for us, that was one of the things that we were starting to get into is how can we be more effective tapping into talent from anywhere in the country? Um, and then, as I mentioned before, Anders being very entrepreneurial um, has had significant growth over the years through mergers. So over the last you know, decade, there's been a number of, of uh, integrations and things that have happened 
that have really helped uh, bolster uh, Anders make it to place it is today. And one thing I will say about Anders is that we are recognized for our culture in terms of uh, being a best place to work, uh, highly uh, desired, and, and we truly are uh, a people-centric organization where we focus on our employee experience and then uh, make sure that our employees then take care of our clients. So, so Tom, that's just a little introduction to uh, Anders. Yeah, that's great. So, Jody, if we start thinking of mergers, then you want to give us some of your thoughts on when you did say, okay, so if I am going to do this, kind of what would it look like and what are my requirements? Yeah. Um, so kind of looking at this, you know, Tom, and you, you and I were talking prior to the prior to the webinar. Um, uh -huh. You know, I just recently purchased a house. Right. And so the, the biggest thing here is that we wanted to I wanted to be exact. I want to know exactly there's certain things I, exact, I needed 100 percent that we had to have in order to do it. Just like a house. I need to have so many rooms in the house, the view, the location, you know, the price, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, it had to be I had to think of prior to even making that first conversation because again I didn't want to fall in love with a firm that had three of the four or five or six different areas mm. that one to look at uh, and I didn't want I didn't want to make it so outrageously stupid that no no company would ever buy it like I'm not going to be able to buy you know a condo in Fort Lauderdale for you know hundred thousand dollars on the ocean you know that's not going to happen <laughs> you know so I, I had sure. to make sure that it was within reason in, in going through and and which made it tough because I, I made my my expectations super high going into it. And that's why when, when I mentioned that I had really no intention of, of selling, it was like, it, it had to, it had to meet all these different criteria. And I'll talk about those in a little bit here, but um, you know, that, that was, that was the big thing. And, and the other thing was just had to have an entire company buy-in, which is kind of tough when you say entire company, because I don't really mean from employee one to employee, you know, 55 that we had, you know, basically our, our, our core level people, our directors, our CFOs had to be, had to be all, 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 you know, on board in order for the, you know, to make this to work. And so that was, uh, that was super important. Yeah. One note I'll make before I go to the next slide, Jody, this picture that people are looking at happened, I think about six weeks after the merger was final. Mm -hmm. It was the first time where the teams really got together. So the pretty much the whole summit team from the VCFO division, and then the part of the advisory team that we were going to work most closely with um, was in the room for the same time kind of doing this. So if people are wanting to kind of when this happened, the merger was official just over a year ago, almost within the week. And then this event happened about six weeks after that, kind of the very Yeah, beginning. I think if you look in the far left corner, Tom, you were in the exact same shirt. Just, just say <laughs> <laughs> it is a different shirt, but it does look like that. And, and you can see Dave on the right taking a picture of the slides too. That's right. Exactly. Funny enough, Jody's missing from this picture. So we'll, yeah. we'll let people wonder why that was. Okay. So now I'll let you go ahead and go on and tell. So you talked about the specific criteria. Do you want to elaborate when it comes to a merger, what those were? Yeah. Yeah. So th these are the five things and I, I made them pretty general, but these are the five things that I was really looking at when, when, when merging or, having, you know, um, you know, any kind of money put in the company, there had to be, you know, these five things had to be met. And, and, and the one thing was, you know, taking care of the team. And so there was, there was the, the difference in, hey, you know, bringing the team over and having them conform to the way that things are being done in that firm or it being, being looked at as, hey, here's how we do it. Let's give a chance to make this work and we'll kind of see how it plays out. And that, that, that was a big part of taking care of the team. So salaries and, and promotions and all that kind of stuff had to be really kind of dialed in um, before that, you know, I, I wanted, you know, it, it was super important, you know, the hours, I didn't want, I didn't want uh, our team to come in and now they've never had an hour requirement ever. You know, they've always worked between 40 to 50 hours a week throughout the year, not no busy season. I didn't want to come into a situation where now they're required to, you know, work, you know, bazillion hours, you know, during a tax season, for instance, you know, that type of thing. And, and so taking care of a team was really important. So I had many different criteria within that, but that as the general purpose, that was uh, that was one of them. Uh, the other thing is operating as independent unit. And this is where, you know, when Dave came to Indianapolis or I was in Indianapolis or Fort Wayne actually, yep. and that uh, we, we really kind of focused on this because uh, this is kind of a unique, uh, unique request where uh, we didn't want to be absorbed in the, our market, meaning our marketing department going in and be absorbed in the marketing department, technology, absorb technology and, and so forth. I wanted to keep everything together as a unit so that we can continue to grow at the pace that we were growing. Because because I, I knew that going into it, that in, in order for us to continue growth at that high rate, we had to make sure that we were, that nothing really got, got in the way of that growth, because that growth is what 
Anders was purchasing. It wasn't purchasing the people inside of the team. It was purchasing that engine that we were create that we created. And so I, I needed it to be a completely separate entity in, in form, not in you know entity itself, but separate department or separate whatever you want to call it, so that everything stayed together, uh, which was super important. Uh, the next thing was was the national brand because you know we. You know, we're completely national. Our, our, our clients go from East Coast to West Coast, North to South. You know, we're not located geographically in any, any area. And so I needed to make sure that the marketing that we're putting out there was attracting that national brand and continue to attract the national brand that, that we had. And so uh, that was, a, that was a, the third one. Um, and then, of course, you know, kind of the, the greedy part of it, I, I guess, is incentivizing the buyout. So if, 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 you know, in knowing myself, I knew that if I came in a situation and I, and I got a ton of money up front, um, I probably wouldn't be as incentivized to hit that $20 million three-year goal because the goal wasn't 20 million coming into, the, into this relationship. I knew that in order for this to be successful, we'd have to do five times what, what, what our revenue was, which is 50 million. And so I knew that, hey, if for this to be a win-win situation for both Anders and for Summit, uh, we'd have to, by, by partnering together, um, we can only do 20 million by partner together. If we can do 50 million, then that's a huge win for both sides. And I, and I knew that was important. And so I wanted to incentivize not only myself, but my director team to really focus in on how can we even go outside of the, the growth pattern and profitability pattern that we've had in the past. And so incentivizing the buyout was really important uh, so that a, a portion of the buyout was paid in year one over the next five years type of thing. And then the second portion was paid on the value at year five, you know, paid over the next seven years. And so again, it gave me a consistent thing of, hey, here's here's my goals, here's where I'm incentivized. Cause I, I really didn't know how I'd handle having a ton of money there. Again, instead of being incentivized, not knowing myself in that position, I didn't want to put the team into a position that that uh, would fail or the or the, the deal in a position that would fail because of because of me. And then the, the last thing was the uh, the seat at the table. You know, so that was important for me because coming into the deal, I wanted to be able to have a seat in discussion making. You know, of course, I wouldn't have the final decision because now we're in a bigger partnership. But I wanted to be there where I could be an equity partner that and, and really kind of make it an, or influence uh, the, the the direction that we were going. Because again, all these areas I talked about earlier were so different. I didn't want to come in and, and just day one, all of a sudden we're going to just change everything and it's going to be completely different now. And we're, and what do we do? Chaos assumes and we we fail miserably. And so I wanted this partnership to really succeed. And I felt having that seat at the table was a, a big part of it. And so those were the five wants that that I had going into the merger that that really for, for a lot of firms, it probably wouldn't have worked. You know, a lot of these, you know, for, for different areas here, maybe it's one, maybe it's five, maybe it's three, you know, that that they would have said, no, can't do that. And then it had been easy for me to say, well, I'm not interested in walking away. So that's why I mentioned I had no intention, didn't think anybody would actually come and say, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with all these five different areas. And and uh, when, when uh, Dave approached me and said, yep, we can definitely do this, we'll work on it. And and uh, that was, uh, it was pretty shocking for me. And it was something that was pretty exciting at the same time. Hey, hey, Jody, let me jump in with uh, with a comment on that. You know, part of that is like your point number two, uh, the independence that you wanted to maintain. I think mm -hmm. part of the theme is, and we'll get into this later on, but there's certainly been, you know, challenges and opportunities in doing this. So like I, underst I understood uh, Jody's request, what he wanted. But on the other hand, as you guys saw earlier in the webcast, you know, Jody went through some pretty innovative things that Summit had done. And so part of it, from my perspective, was some of those things you've learned a lot more about than we have. And I want to make sure, how can I get those lessons that you've learned? How can I get that to flow into Anders? And so that was, and I think over the last year, since we closed the merger, there's been a lot of that, that I understand what you're trying to do, but here's some other things to consider. And now it is different because we're part of a larger organization. We have different growth plans, those types of things. So I just wanted to make that point on this slide that there was a lot coming in and you'll see, we'll talk about Anders in a second, but there's a lot of things that we've had to, you know, mediate and negotiate and, and figure out what's the best solution for the firm going forward. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Dave. Um, you know, everything is not 100% one way or the other. It was a negotiation. It was a working together and, you know, kind of looking at what's the best for now, the combined uh, entity, our combined structure to, to, to be successful. Yeah, so Dave, I'd love 
for you to hear as you were looking for partners to merge with? What, what was the Anders perspective? Yeah. So to, to one of Jody's points earlier, you know, we actually have a lot of conversations with firms that are not interested in merging. And that's that's fine with us because we we want to have the conversation and plant the seed uh, and just tell people our story. And here's what we're doing. Here's our objective. Here's what we're trying to do. And at some point in your growth cycle, that may be attractive to you and it may make sense. Like for Summit, uh, Jody and Adam and the team had just crossed 20 years. So crossing that milestone, kind of reflecting on the first 20 years, where do you want to be in the next 20 years? You know, that may be an appropriate time to, to have a discussion with us because it may or may not make sense to do that. So, but to this first point, we go through a very structured strategic planning process and we meet multiple times per year. And as part of that, we identify specifically for the advisory practice, we're interested in acquisitions, you know, or, it, you know, uh, mergers, both audit and tax firms, those types of things, but specifically for advisory, we go through and we identify our top five areas for that year that we think our clients are demanding that service and we need to be able to deliver that. So specifically, when we go out and have these conversations, we know exactly what we're looking for. So similar to Jody's point about having you know, the specific requirements, we have those as well. This is our ideal profile that, that we would like to look for. Um, and so when we go out and have these conversations, it's not like a you know, we'll come back and decide if it fits or not. As we have the conversation, we know exactly, you know, how in our mind, how that would work. And then of course, we need the input from the, from, you know, whoever we're talking to to actually figure out if that makes sense. So that vision of the future and making sure that, you know, that, uh, that that makes sense and that works for both parties, uh, that's part of point number one there too. Uh, the second point, culture, that's really the first conversation. Uh, and, and so when we have these initial conversations, if, if the culture match isn't there, anything else is a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And so for us, that was critically important uh, was to make sure that the culture was matched. And so we do intro one hour calls where we explain our story with people all the time. And that's part of what we want to express is the importance of our culture and how hard we work to maintain it. And so we want to make sure that whoever we're talking with hears that. And because they also need to make sure that it's a good fit with us as well. So that culture match is a is a huge, a huge part. The third point here is that, you know, what we see the CPA profession and just in general, you know, CPAs have always been the most trusted advisor to their clients. Well, I think the shift that, that is happening now is really that shift to become the most valuable advisor. And, and that's part of by adding more advisory services to everything that we do and ensuring every client interaction, we deliver value. As part of that shift, we're looking for firms that can help us achieve that objective in terms of how we grow. Point number four was we had a very successful practice already in this area at the firm. So we had a CAS practice. We referred to it as, as OAS, Outsourced Accounting Services. So we already had a very successful and very profitable uh, group here at Anders already. However, we recognized that if we went out and found a firm that could, that could come in and actually add additional expertise and more higher level CFO related services, that that's what we view as, as key to you know, our, our future going forward. So, uh, so for us, we had identified CFO services as an area we specifically wanted to go out and invest in. And then as part of those discussions, that's part of how we, we found Summit. And then the last point here, number five was, and I mentioned this in the intro, which is we had already been experimenting with, with uh, hybrid work solutions and, and fully remote positions. And when we looked at Summit, it was like, okay, this was an opportunity because Summit had been working fully remote for over a decade. And so as a result of that, that was something that we were looking for as well, because we believe that was going to be key for the future. And so if anybody could help us accelerate the employee experience for fully remote employees, we were very interested in that. So these were some of the things that going through our process, we had identified that in any firm that we were going to look at, these were some of the things that, that were very high priority for us as well. Yeah, it sure seems like this list, both from Jody, you and Adam's perspective and Dave from the Ender side would make it really easy to fail out some people early so that you're not just spending time that ultimately is not going to turn into anything Yeah, um, for that. And Adam and I are still wondering, based on that criteria, why they picked us, but uh, <laughs> um, we're happy they did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go on and talk about this. 
kind of from the firm perspective, your small firm, and we'll talk just a little bit about obstacles and opportunities in there, but what's your thought? What's it like for a, a small firm? Yeah, a small firm. So, so let, let's define what a small firm is, right? Because there's a lot of different sizes of small firms. So we, we started, we were bootstrapped, you know, from the very beginning 20 years ago with no clients. And so we basically started from zero uh, to a million, million to two million, two million and so forth to to where we, like I said, doubling our size every every 10 years, you can kind of, or every three years, you can kind of go backward and kind of see exactly where we were at, you know, three years ago, five years ago, and so forth. And so we were approaching that $10 million mark. And so small firm, $10 million, getting into a giant firm, you know, what what do we, you know, how's that going to be? Are we going to get lost in the shuffle? You know, the, all those things came into mind. And I know Adam and I had a lot of conversations about it. You know, is this the right move, the right timing? You know, should we wait? You know, should we get to that twenty million dollar mark? Because all the, the you know the the companies that you know that with the investors is that hey twenty million dollars where you need to be before you sell. It's like well that'll be three years from now. Do we wait? You know, do we build up until then, or or should we you know look for a, a you know a suitor at the ten million dollar mark? And so that's why we really never put our feet out there saying hey we're you know we're ready to sell. You know you know lights are going on. It was one of those things that we weren't. We didn't think that we would you know, it, it would it would be beneficial for us until we got to that $20 million mark. So so again, it was one of those things, you know, hey, how are we going to fit into this mold? You know, you, you showed a picture and there's a background picture of the team retreats. You know, that was one of the big things we had. We have team retreats every six months in which we bring the team together, you know, and spend a lot of money, $3,000 a, a person to, to be on those retreats. You know, and again, that's how a remote team needs to function. You know, that's how a virtual team needs to function. How's Andrew's going to be able to, are they going to, are they going to accept that as something that we can continue on? Because again, I, we feel it's super core to our success and reten, retention of employees and so forth. And, and so there's a lot of things like that just kind of going through our heads, you know, Hey, is this going to be a good fit? And, 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 you know, to, to Dave and Robert and, and Tony's credit when they came out and, and, and spoke with us, they, they really hit all these head on and, and, you know, say, hey, we don't want you to change. We want you to be exactly how you're doing it. We want you to continue on with your success. We love the way that you're doing things, you know, and, and I, I think that was a, a, a big part of it because, you know, the, the, you know a, lot, a lot of them are just like, hey, you'll be part of this big group now and you'll be, you'll be doing this, you'll be doing that. And it's like, well, that's not really what we, that's not the growth. That's not how we grew. And, and so that the growth was important. And so the growth was important. The people were important. You know, everything, everything that we mentioned is important. So this was a big, a big issue, you know, and that's why, you know, Tom, that's why we had you come out and, and meet right. their team. You know, that was for your decision, right? Before we made that decision, giving you that veto power. If you said, no, you know, you, you don't want to work with Dave and I could understand completely why <laughs> uh, that would be, it'd be an over and done type of thing. And so Super important. David, I'd love yeah. to get your perspective on it. Yeah. And just to to add to that a little bit, you know, I, I think it was important going back to that culture point that that was one of our key, uh, you know, our, our top five key things. Um, we wanted to make sure when we met Jody and Adam, you know, we, we felt they fit how they described the culture, but we also wanted to give the teams a chance to get together and meet each other. So before we closed the deal, uh, and actually before the letter of intent was signed, we did get the teams together to spend some time together and make sure that there was a cultural match on both sides. So I, th I think that's really important. Um, yeah. And then just to clarify on this slide a little bit, you know, when we say big firm, what does that mean? Uh, you know, so Anders now has 400 plus employees. Uh, a couple of years ago, we cracked the top 100 in terms of uh, the, the CPA firm rankings. Uh, this year, we jumped 16 spots to number 78, and we're one of the, the top fastest growing firms in the country. Uh, so Summit has joined uh, into uh, and become part of Anders. And that challenge of how, you know, so, so uh, Jody, Adam, and the team, you know, when you're a 50-person firm, it's a lot different in how you make decisions than a 400-person firm. It's kind of like the old adage of, you know, you may be able to be very nimble and move fast, but I got a big ship that we're that we're moving here. Mm -hmm. And so it's harder to move that big ship. And so as a result of that, you know, there there has been, uh, you know, challenges in terms of a decision that before, you know, could have been made by a few people and let's just implement it and go. Now, part of the challenge of this in a larger firm is that there's more stakeholders to consider. And when I say stakeholders, I don't mean partners per se, but I mean, okay, well, if we do this, 
it could have this potential impact on this other group over here. And we have to look at equity and fairness throughout the firm and all those types of things. So there's other, other factors that start to come into play that culturally can be a challenge when you're used to moving really fast and nimble. It's hard to sometimes have to slow down because there's a whole, it becomes much more complex when you become part of a, a larger firm. Yeah, that's a perfect beginning of, let's talk about some obstacles and opportunities. So from both of your perspectives, let's talk about kind of what we saw that were potential great things, potential obstacles we've run into at, once things came together. Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, we, we've got five, five addressed here. I would say the one that before we even get into that, probably the, the biggest question is, and, and someone brought it up in, 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 the, uh, in the webinar is, do we keep our name? You know, do we keep the mm -hmm. summit name? You know, that summit's been around for 20 years. You know, do we keep that? And, you know, the, the, the question there is, or the answer to that is, yeah, we keep it for the short term, but for the long term, we've got to merge it into the, the bigger, the bigger Anders. We can't do that day one. And there's a lot of, a lot of folks with Anders had a really struggled with that initially, you know, why, why are we just not calling them Anders now and, and doing all that? And, and, the, and the simple reason is because with the way that we market uh, we, again, it's an inbound marketing, that content marketing, you know, there's a lot of things involved in that where we, we, the way we get clients, people are, you know, see us, you know, five years from now or five years ago, and they're finally, get, it's time for them to make the switch and they're coming aboard. You know, there's a lot of different things that are involved in that. And uh, it, it was super important for us to keep the name and transition it slowly over, over a period of, a period of years. And that's, that's what we decided to do. So again, First, it was Summit CPA Group. Then it was Summit CPA Division of Anders. Now it's Summit CFO by Anders. And then it'll eventually be Summit or it'll be Anders CFOs and then, you know, completely, you know, Anders. So it's, it's more of a gradual shift is what we what we decided that made the most sense uh, to keep the brand awareness there and to gradually move that brand over time uh, to the Anders brand versus making a knee-jerk reaction and all of a sudden Summit's gone and how do clients find us? And, and we didn't want that situation to, to be there. So I would say name was the, one of the biggest obstacles or biggest hurdles to make sure that everybody's understanding and aware within Anders, within Summit, why we're doing it the way we're doing it and then transitioning it through time. And it, it took a while to come up with the, the strategy for that. Yeah. And, there, and th there were a lot of decisions similar to that in terms of, uh, you know, we had an integration steering committee. We knew what we needed to do but for each of those steps, there was a lot of work that the, especially the administrative teams needed to do in HR, in marketing, in technology. Uh, we can't just slam these two organizations together and hope for the best on day one. We have to build a plan and then we have to execute the plan. We have to monitor progress and make sure all that happens. So that's part of the complexity of, of moving into a larger firm uh, where you have to deal with a lot of these administrative things that are critically important both to the employee experience and the client experience. Yeah, and I, I said like HR, one of the big things were is that, you know, we weren't heavy on titles at Summit. So we, we, we weren't in the traditional that, hey, yeah, you know, you, you earn your stripes with every different title and there's a mm -hmm. different title every two years and you get promotions and so forth. That's really not how we, how we worked and how we had, had ever worked. And so, which was different than, you know, than what, uh, what Anders was, you know, had, had within their model. And so that was one of those things that was kind of tricky. You know, how do you blend it? You know, do you blend it with the entire... Anders in general, you blend it with just the, you know, our, our CFO division itself and how, how to work through that. And so that was a, that was an interesting, uh, interesting model. It took us about a year to really kind of hone into it to where we felt, hey, this is fair on both sides, you know, fair on the folks that started at Anders that had this idea and here's what they were doing and then fair on the folks at, at Summit that was, you know, doing it a, a different way. And so that was a, um, that was a fun one. Uh, just titles themselves, you know, what did they mean? You know, our, our titles meant something completely different than what Anders' titles were. And so, again, it was hard to, hard to, it was tricky to blend the two so that it was very equitable amongst both sides. And Tom, I know you want to move to the next point, but but one mm -hmm. thing I, I would like to say is that, you know, it, it is important, and this is this is one of the things from the beginning, it's important for both sides to recognize the strengths of the other. So in this particular circumstance, Anders was rapidly growing, Summit was rapidly growing. So you have two very successful organizations, but we did things differently. And so whenever mm -hmm. you have to decide, okay, now that we're a combined organization under Anders CPAs and advisors, 
Now, how do we behave going forward? What's our decision? And so it's important that both sides as part of those discussions come with an open mind and recognize that, well, the way we did it, it's been successful, but for the future state of the firm, what's the right answer? And so I think that whole process of how you negotiate and compromise and respect each other's points of view, I think it's critical as you execute that process. Yeah, great point. And I will say you guys were very transparent hey, here are the things we're looking at. Here's why maybe you think it's taking longer than it should, or maybe it's harder than what you're thinking, that I felt like we were keep being kept pretty well informed about that. Yeah, and transparency is one of our core values. So we we yeah. tried to, in everything that we do, we try to be as transparent as possible. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons why we're doing this this webinar. You know, it's like, well, why are, why are you giving away all your secrets? And for yeah. us, transparency and being uh, you know, as as Tom mentioned at the top, we actually wrote a an ebook that includes mm -hmm. all of this information in it. So there'll be a QR code that we'll show at the end where you can download it for free. But we're very, you know, to the thought leadership model and you know the things that Jody talked about earlier from a marketing perspective. That's doing that is is very key, uh, you know, for the entire firm. Yeah, yeah, and, and transparency and compensation something that uh, most folks out there probably are cringing when they hear about that. Uh, but we've been transparent with our compensation for a long time. And, and what, what does that mean? It's like, well, you know, we, we've been basing our, our compensation on a base pay, which is a very solid national average salary that, mm -hmm. you know, folks would like, but then also giving the opportunity, hey, based on that base pay, here's the book of business that you need to be managing. And so that, and then we have a variable comp based on if it goes higher or lower. And so folks can tell that, hey, if you're you know, managing a $700,000 book of business, well, here's the amount of money you're making. And so it makes no difference really mm -hmm. what color you are, what sex you are, any of that. That's completely out of, out of the picture because it's based on what you're, what you're performing for the company, which again, is a, a, a different, different concept altogether, which made it super tough to get, to, you know, with the steering committee or with the compensation committee, understanding that. And the nice thing about that is they're very, very welcoming of it. Once we explained the importance of it, we just didn't do it to do it. There was reasoning behind it. And uh, we were able to incorporate uh, their existing team into the structure and, and rolling that out here uh, fairly, you know, fairly soon to where, you know, again, that whole, our whole department will be under this um, variable comp structure, which again, was a very tricky concept um, to understand from, for a firm that's been doing it completely different for forever. Um, how to incorporate other points of view or other 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 ways of doing things. And I think that's a ton of credit to Anders for that, uh, to be able to, get, to have that open mind where a lot of firms would not have. Yeah, and, and that was that's a key question in terms of, is it acceptable within the same firm to have different compensation models and different mm -hmm. approaches to compensation? So that that was one of the things, and we're constantly evaluating uh, the the fairness, equity of how we compensate employees and looking at different models in terms of what do employees want? How do they, are they valuing the benefits that we have now or not? And so we're constantly looking at adjusting and tweaking how we do that. Um, and I think that will continue to evolve as we go into the future. I like the way you're looking at each of these as an obstacle and an opportunity and sometimes the exact same way you're looking at it, right? They do it differently. Oh, there's a cool opportunity there at the same time. It can be a challenge for us. What about from a marketing philosophy? Marketing is a tough one, right? Because everybody, every marketing person has got a different way of doing marketing. You know, that's the kind of the genius about marketing. You know, there's no perfect way of doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so our marketing has always been an inbound marketing approach where we constantly floating content marketing out there. And that's how we drive revenue. Again, it's a completely different than a traditional law firm, different accounting firm where the partners are the centerpiece of that. And they're driving the, you know, they're driving the referrals to the company. Our company is driving referrals in the opposite direction there. So it's a, a different approach altogether. And to combine two different entities that have two different, completely different approaches is kind of a, a tricky, tricky concept altogether. You've got to get buy-in on both sides, which is really tough because generally marketing people dig in, you know, they're like, this is the best way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, that, that was a super, that was a big obstacle that we had to overcome and I feel we've overcome uh, in, in a very successful manner, which we can kind of incorporate two different means of marketing within the same company, uh, which is, I think, kind of unique at, at the size of uh, what we are right now. And so that was a, a, a really big, a big plus that uh, Anders was open to and was able to, to adapt to that type of approach. Yeah. What about from the speed of change? 
And I think we kind of talked about this one earlier, you know, yeah. uh, Jody, Adam and the team were very, you know, we're used to making decisions and rapidly implementing and just go. And that's great when you're a 50 person organization, when you're a 400 person organization, it's a lot more difficult to move that quickly. So we still want to stay nimble. We still want to move, but it's just different when you have more constituents and different things that you do. So I, I know Jody and Adam and, and others, I know it was a real adjustment to the, the that we can't move at that speed. Um, and so that, that was a challenge, but I think, you know, as we look back at this, I think both sides looked at that to make sure that that we move as quickly as we can uh, in, mm -hmm. in terms of how we move forward. Yeah. Yeah, this was Jeremy, surely you. Sure. This was a tough one to handle. And I still think there can be improvements on both sides on this one. So I think speed, you know, speed of change can happen quicker. But I do agree that uh, there's got there's a lot more to consider uh, being a 400 person shop than there is a 50 person shop. Sure. And some of this probably wasn't a surprise, Jody. I mean, you knew you were joining a larger firm. Some of this, I would assume that you knew this was going to happen coming in. Yep. Yeah. And then what about culture? We, both of you had that on your list of important, they were, they were part of your big five. Yeah, culture is super important. I mean, it, it, it came down to, you know, as David mentioned, we were also on the top, you know, places to work and all, you yep. know, forever, you know, type of thing. Retention was a uh, very high, you know, at uh, at Summit prior to prior to the pandemic, and and the pandemic had a little, you know, a little curveball to it there. But we wanted to make sure that the employer attention that people really enjoyed coming to work. You know, people had a purpose of being there. You know, it was it was more than just simply you know getting a paycheck. You know, we wanted people to make friends at work. You know, how do you do that in a remote environment? There's a lot of different ways, and that's a different topic altogether. But we wanted to make sure that all of that didn't change once we went hybrid. Because uh, we at one point we were brick and mortar, then you know then we went hybrid about ten years ago. You know where we had a few people that worked outside outside of the office and a few people work in the office. Then it was until two thousand what thirteen that we went fully remote. And so fully remote and for the last ten years being fully remote, that's a, a huge different type of culture that you're bringing to. And we didn't want that to to go away. Um, you know, coming to a firm that was brick and mortar, trying to do the op, you know, trying to go, trying to go remote as well, you know, type of thing. So we were, we were going one way, they're coming another way. We want to make sure that that culture was a super solid blend. And it wasn't until we actually got a chance to hang out with uh, the folks at Anders uh, that we felt, hey, this culture is pretty similar. You know, we're going to, we'll, we'll be very successful. Um, you know, and as long as they didn't bring their best, coolest people there and everybody else was, you know, horrible, you know, it, it should work out pretty well. And then of course they didn't, they didn't do that. Yeah. And Tom, to your point, you know, the, these were all, we knew that we were going to have to deal with these topics. And I yep. think the challenge was we knew there were going to be obstacles. How do we turn them into a net positive? And I think, yeah. you know, looking at and really thinking about both firms were successful on their own, but how do we create future success? I think by having that point of view and, and everybody being open to new ideas and say, huh, we never thought about doing it that way, but that actually is a really good idea. As long as, you know, people coming into these types of combinations are willing and open to have that conversation, I think that's essential for this thing to work. If either side is going to dig in and say, we will never, you know, then that's probably, it, that's going to be a really challenging situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was happy you asked kind of what was my perspective and then what do we see on the Anders side? So if you're an employee finding out that this merger has happened, kind of what was our view? So let me give my perspective first. And then I've got um, some peers at Anders who said, hey, here's what we were thinking. So from the summit side, small firm going to a bigger firm, they saw this expanded career opportunity um, for a lot of people in the firm, but especially younger people in the firm who say, I'm going to get into an area and want to do something different or for my own career growth. And you've got more places that you can grow. And there had been times where people had left the firm because they wanted to do something very different. And our smaller firm didn't offer that. And so that was one that people looked and said, oh, that's kind of cool. I've got more career opportunities for that. Something I saw almost immediately I'm still using is that we have ex more experts to give us guidance. So bigger firm, um, Dave, I had to reach out to you several times about, hey, have you had anyone? We've got a really good banking expert in Paul. I've got this kind of question. He said, hey, why don't you check with Paul? And he was great. And that was something that didn't exist in our firm before to do that. And so that was a really helpful thing for us to have. Um, if I think of potential obstacles, just mixing these two different teams, there's a, Andrews is based in St. Louis and there's an office-based team and hybrid and we're a remote team. And there were times you could tell the way the teams collaborate that there's one team that's used to collaborating face-to-face -face in an office 
and you got the remote team that is very comfortable being on camera and that's just sort of how things work. Even some of the simple things like Anders tended to use email a lot, even for internal communications, very normal within Summit that we didn't. And so we would be sending Teams messages to everyone and not getting responses because it wasn't that usual that that was the way they communicate. And they might be sending email to us saying, why don't you answer my email? And we're saying, well, that's not really what we're using it for. So we had some sort of, hey, why don't we communicate in this way? These are the more normal or not normal. These are the ways that we're going to choose that we want to communicate. But that was an obvious obstacle up front. And then new leadership. And I'll say initially, maybe an obstacle, just who are the people? So when you're trying to get a decision made, who is it that's deciding? And when someone says this person owns it, initially, you're just trying to understand who people are and what their roles are and why they would influence in these areas. And so that took a little bit of time to get through that. Is I asked uh, two of my peers on the Anders side, hey, what were you thinking? One of the big opportunities that they had said was it's a different way to work. So one of the examples I gave was that we were using a lot of offshore resource for low-level accounting work. Said so on the other side, we hadn't done that that much. So we learned a lot about how you did it and very quickly embraced that and said, okay, we're going to start doing those things for what we're doing. Um, the other was opportunities around market influence. So we've got a more clients, a larger presence in certain niches, and we've got more influence in those areas and we can share across learnings for those things. On the obstacle side, one of the obvious dealt sort of with multiple technologies. Mm -hmm. And one example that they gave was we both had sort of our client list. And as you look at how we're going to work in the future, some of that was categorizing clients differently. And they said, we think we underestimate the amount of time that you go back and say, well, the way you're reading, it's not quite right. So the list wasn't quite right. Let's change it. Let's do it this way and that way. So it's putting some kind of practical things together. And we both got our tools that we like. And so I think both sides and sometimes are like, well, of course, everyone's going to step over and use this tool because it works so well. But when both sides think their tool is great, then you have to have some discussion about how you're going to get through and make that go. Um, and then finally, cultural alignment and clear communication, right? There, there are times where you hear decisions are made and you have to be careful not to get into, well, is that the way Anders operates versus where people, let's talk about how this decision was made. And maybe there's miscommunication that happens. I do think things like the retreat were a really smart idea that as soon as you meet people face to face and get to know them, it makes it a whole lot easier to pick up the phone and call and say, this didn't seem like it was right. Is this really what you meant? rather than building some big story in your head for someone that you've never met before. So that's one of the ways I think we've got past those. Hey, Tom, if I could put you on the spot for a second here. Yeah. Um, when, when, you're th when, when going through the uh, merger process, what was the one thing in the back of your head saying, you know, if, if this happens, I'm out of here? Oh, interesting. Um, well, it's funny you say that because when, when I first came back from before the LOI, you guys invited us out, said, what do you think? I told my wife, she's like, oh, this is a bad idea. You shouldn't be doing this. And the one thing that made me feel better about it is I said, knowing Jody and Adam, they want the team to be successful. They wouldn't do a deal that wasn't like this. But to get back to your answer, probably we have a lot of freedom in what we do and how we do our jobs. And I think the one thing that could have had me leave is if someone said, here's how you have to do it and you no longer are empowered for some of the decisions that I think is make us really effective with clients. Yeah. And that, Tom, so that was probably the one big one. Yeah. That's a delicate balance. Cause on one hand, we want employees to be entrepreneurial and have a lot of that flexibility. Yes. But on the other hand, as we grow and scale the organization, we have to have more structure, more processes, those types of things. So it's an interesting balance. And I think obviously that affects culture. And so, you right. know, a lot of this is, is an evolution uh, and it just depends where you are on the journey. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think that's where the clear lines of communication can really help that if it is, okay, here's something you used to be able to decide that you can't anymore. An understanding of why it is and yep, okay, I get that can make people feel much better than just, okay, someone said you used to be able to and now you can't do those things. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh, yeah. Okay, so if if people are out there thinking, okay, I'm actually thinking about this, you can anticipate about how you thought about, tell us a little bit more about what you think are the key things people should be thinking about if they're thinking about this kind of merger. Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. I, I guess the, the big thing is that you have to know what you want. And so like, like I mentioned about the house earlier, mm -hmm. you know, do you want a two story? Do you want a one story? Do you want a condo? Do you want it on the beach? Do you want it in, in the middle of a, a mountain range? You know, what, what do you want? is really important to identify that internally before you even do any kind of searching out there. Cause you're going to talk to, you know, in the event that you're marketable, you're going to talk to many different folks that are going to have many different ideas. And, you know, that might not be exactly what you want. And in the worst case scenario is you don't want to, 
to do something and then have regrets afterwards. And so I, I think it's important to really spell it out, you know, have, you know, talk to your partner. Adam and I spoke many times, you know, here's the ones that we have to have. Here are the kind of things that would be kind of cool if we didn't, if we had, and here's the kind of things that if we didn't get, that's okay too, but you need to know what that is before going in there. And so I think that was important. So the wants are important there, but then being in alignment with, uh, with the partners of the firm that's, you know, looking to, to, you know, to, to possibly be sold. So we, we, we had to both be in line going into the, into the deals. And, and there were several opportunities that we had that we walked away with much larger firms, much smaller firms, equity firms that we were like, no, nope, that's not, not what we're looking for. And uh, that, that's, that, that's, that's good too. You know, identify the no as quick as possible. And I, and I say that with sales calls, you know, you never want to get to yes as quick. You want to get to no quicker. You know, you want to get to know, you know, from the website, you want to get to know from the initial call. You want to disqualify that person quicker than you want them to say yes. And it's kind of a backwards approach when you think about it. But again, that no thing is super important because that no is going to get you to the right, the right, uh, the right uh, partner. Yeah. So, so Tom, I would say the number one thing I would suggest is to, uh, if this conversation has been helpful to you, I'd recommend downloading the booklet, the merger booklet that you're going yeah. to show the QR code in, in just a few minutes. But I think, you know, what we've talked about here is maybe 5% of what we talk about in the booklet, right? And there's a yeah. ton of great information that you, hopefully you'll read our story and you'll say, I didn't think about that. That's, that's a really good idea. I could see where that would be an issue. I think that'd be very educational for you. But, but on the slide, this first one here, the, the first one about being open, I think that's important both before the transaction, but then also after the transaction. So as Jody mm -hmm. mentioned, he's got his house analogy and he knows what he wants. But on the other hand, if you, you get out there and you start looking, it's like, you know, I wanted a three bedroom, but man, it's got all these other things and it's only a two bedroom. I think I'll give on that one. So the whole openness to compromise both before the deal in terms of what it is that you're looking for. And then once you've done the deal, if you're rigid in terms of it, you know, it, and there are certain things, you know, core values that you need to be solid on. Mm -hmm. I get that. But other than that, there's got to be flexibility. There's got to be a willingness and an openness uh, to change and evolve. Yeah, that's a great point. And Jody, you had not mentioned earlier, um, well, you had, you and Adam put these together. I wonder what's the importance of having those five things if it's more than one person, as opposed to one person? Do you think having that five list for you and Adam was good to be able to quickly say, okay, are we agreeing? And if Adam went on one is, yeah, that seems pretty good. And you're saying no. Yeah, or are you going it, back to that list and saying, let's go back to our five and which is it not? It was very important for us, right? Because, you know, when, when you're in meetings and hearing different things, I'm hearing what Dave's saying, Adam might be hearing something completely different. And then when we kind of get back together and say, you know, hey, here's what we're thinking. Here's what he meant. Here's what you're, you're, we're going with. I, I think it's important that you, you both, all the partners have to be in, in alignment. The partners that are going to make the decision yeah. have to be in alignment 100% going into it. Um, and if, if one is wavering on one of the five points or six points or 10 points that you get, whatever you decide, then I think it's important to have that discussion um, afterwards, not during the, the meetings, obviously, but having the discussion yeah. afterwards. How important is that has been, you know, number five, you know, is it super important? Is it a deal breaker? And if it's a deal breaker, then you go on. If it's a deal breaker, yeah. we're either partner, you go on. <laughs> you know, yeah. if it's something that there's, there's some flexibility with. Then yet, and then you kind of you can discuss it and, and talk about it. But I think that was important to have for us to both be in alignment before uh, we actually uh, met with with any any one person. Yeah, and David, I would assume the same for being part of the strategy, right? Yeah. That you're not coming back saying, "Look at what I found," and now you're trying to sell it all inside yeah. the firm. Does this fit? That's why that strategic yeah. planning process is so important. We know yeah. exactly what we're looking for, and we know what the characteristics are. And as a result of that, we can make faster decisions because we've already hashed through what it is that we're actually looking for. Yeah. So, Tom, I know we're running short on time, but just a yeah. couple of points on this from the due diligence yeah. standpoint. So we have a we have a I think it's a three or four page due diligence checklist that we go with that that really facilitates a lot of those conversations. And as part of doing due diligence, that's when a lot of these issues arise that, oh, you do it this way. We do it that way. So and so we kind of after due diligence, we went into this knowing these are the areas that we're going to have to discuss, compromise, mm -hmm. those types of things. I think the next one on the leadership structure, I think that's really important to know how decisions are being made. If you're used to making decisions mm -hmm. in a certain way, you got to know how the other side is going to do that. And if it's significantly different, you have to make sure that you're going to be okay with how those decisions are being made and then how the, how the structure is in terms of 
who who is in certain leadership roles, how are those roles determined? Kind of all of that context is really in, important. And then the last one here, which I think is our number one and our last one, which is culture. If if we're going to do anything, we have to make sure that it, we maintain and enhance the culture on a go forward basis. So th those things, in addition to to reading the booklet, I think would be the things that I would I would recommend. It's a great point. So we've teased the booklet enough times. Here's people's QR code. I mentioned at the top of the program that we, you will get the slides. So if you if you miss capturing it right now, you can go out and get it. But this is, I think, a really good story that people can go through and read if you really want some detail um, behind that and go through that. So we'd we'd encourage people to do that. Yeah, it's it's over 40 pages, I think. So there there's a lot of meat in there and there's a lot of perspectives from people both on the Anders side and then on the summit side coming into Anders. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. People can see that we put your LinkedIn contact. So if people had something in particular, they want to follow up with either of our speakers for this, mm -hmm. but thank you. I, it's a little bit different webinar to say, here was my story and kind of how I went through that. So thank you guys for doing that. So I hope you enjoyed the program today. What We have a couple of things for people as they walk away. Um, we have a couple of different podcasts and we would hope that people want to keep learning from this. So we've got the Modern CPA Success Show. Um, a variety of topics that people can learn about kind of what we think is the direction that, that CPA firms are going. We've also got the But Who's Counting that Dave hosts. And so we've got that podcast as well. So we'd really encourage people to listen to both of those podcasts. If people want to be more interactive, and we hope you do, you can join the CFO community, a Slack community where you can see the different channels as you look at the screen there. People just communicating different topics, asking questions, getting input. Um, there's a marketing meetup. And they have different topics around that, but there's also other topics that we would encourage people to get into. We talked about CFO services that Summit has provided. So we've got a pretty intensive course that people can take, the virtual CFO playbook. So if you want to do this, it is 15 modules that people go through as you complete that. And it goes through everything that we do for delivering CFO services. You'll, as you finish that, you get a one hour coaching session about how you get that implemented, the free book, the subscription to the CFO Slack. The tools that we use, we have a pricing module that we're actually giving out to people. We do as much as we can share. So if you have heard the term CAS 2.0, CFO services, and are thinking that here is a great way to try and jumpstart yourself for that, and you get 24 CPE credits as part of that. And if you look at all that and say, oh, but I would rather join you guys, you seem pretty cool. Please check out our careers page. Summit CPA and Ayers both at the moment have separate careers pages, but we really, we're hiring. We're looking for some really good talent. We hope that people would consider coming working with us. Jody and Dave, thank you very much for today and, and thanks to our guests for joining us today.